Good afternoon to all of you. Please let me start with a personal remark. Europe's wealth is rooted not only in a strong economy, but also in intelligent supranational governance and regulation. And that is the reason why we are here for. Let me welcome all of you, not only on my behalf as BAREC chair of this year, but also on behalf on the BAREC incoming chair, Sebastian Zoriano, and on behalf of the responsible vice chair, Hank Don. And please allow me an additional remark, questions will be taken after the presentation. This BAREC press event serves particularly the information about the launch of the public consultation on the draft BAREC guidelines on net neutrality, which have been approved by the BAREC plenary last Friday. The huge interest of stakeholders today already shows why this item will be in the clear focus of the today's event. Of course, we will furthermore briefly inform you about several further BAREC documents that have been approved for public consultation and the new BAREC information sharing portal. Finally, we will announce the planned next meetings and events. Starting immediately with net neutrality, the hot topic, let me mention that issuing guidelines on the implementation of the net neutrality provisions until the end of August means a high profile and an ambitious task within a very tight timing. In addition, I want to stress that our regulation is stricter and more robust at the FCC order on net neutrality. It has a much stronger legal basis passed by the co-legislator. It's pretty sure that there are high expectations, not only from the EU legislator side, but also from all stakeholders. That's why BAREC started with an inclusive process in close cooperation with the European Commission and involving stakeholders on European level, including telco operators, content providers, and the civil society. This was followed by an in-depth discussion and assessment within BAREC which led to the draft guidelines presented today. The outcome is, according to our view, balanced and pragmatic, although covering various complex issues. The consultation launched today provides the opportunity to road test the draft guidelines. Let me briefly say a few words on the role of barracks guidelines. To be very clear on this, the guidelines do not create new rules, but are about providing practical guidance on the regulatory implementation of the net neutrality rules laid down in the regulation. This is necessary as the new regulation has to be enforced by national regulators. That's exactly why the net neutrality regulation designated BAREC with the task to provide guidance to NRAs. This task aims particularly at contributing to the consistent implementation across Europe and needs to be done in close cooperation with the European Commission and after consulting stakeholders. As already mentioned, BAREC has to deliver by the end of August. Having said that, the draft guidelines follow the structure of the regulation. I would like to hand over now to the BAREC Working Group chairs to present in more detail 
the content of the draft guidelines. Please, Ben, you have the floor. Thank you, Wilhelm. So, looking at what's covered by the regulation, the guidelines start by establishing the aim and the scope of the regulation as set out in the first two articles of the regulation. So firstly, if we look at the central piece of the regulation, Article 3.1 enshrines in law a right for end users to access and distribute information and content, to use and provide applications and services, and to use terminal equipment of their choice. And this right relates to using internet access services. So who are the end users in this context? Well, drawing upon the existing European regulatory framework, the Berwick guidelines clarify that it's not just directed to consumers, it also applies to business users, and it applies to content and application providers when they are using internet access services to reach other end users. The guidelines also set out the kinds of services covered by the regulation and those which are not covered by the regulation. So the regulation covers internet access services and specialized services. The term specialized services itself is not used in the regulation, but it's a, a short term that we use in Berwick's guidelines to describe a much longer term which you can find in Article 3.5 of the regulation or on page three of our guidelines. In the guidelines, we also discuss sub-internet services. These could be services which restrict access to specific services or applications, such as VoIP or video streaming. Or they could be what some people call walled garden offers or granny packages. Uh, these are services which allow access to only a predefined part of the internet. So Beric makes an important point that sub-internet services like these would be a circumvention of the regulation and consequently regulators should therefore deem them to be within scope of and infringing the regulation. So the guidelines are clear that regulators should not accept services being provided as substitutes for internet access services. These would be circumvening the regulation. But there are other services which Barrett considers to be outside the scope of the regulation and therefore not subject to the rules. So the, the first sub-bullet here on private networks, well, according to Article 2, the regulation is focused on publicly available electronic communication services. And Barrett considers that access to the internet provided, for example, by cafes and restaurants or by internal <laughs> corporate networks we consider these to be out of scope because they're typically limited to a predetermined group and as such would not be considered publicly available. Uh, the guidelines also recognize that with some services, access to the internet may be limited by the nature of the terminal equipment. Um, and the, the examples given here are the limited functions of machine to machine devices such as smart meters or ebook readers. And Barrett considers these services to be out of scope. So finally on this slide, IP interconnection services. Interconnection services enable traffic to be exchanged between networks and they're distinct from internet access services which are aimed at end users. So Beric doesn't consider interconnection services to be within the scope of the regulation. Nevertheless, the guidelines do say that regulators may take into account the interconnection policies and practices of ISPs insofar as they have any effect on restricting the end user rights set out in Article 3.1. Next slide. So as many of you will know, uh, zero rating is the practice of applying a price of zero to the data traffic associated with a particular application and with the data not counting towards any data cap the end user has. In recent years, including during the negotiations of the regulation, there has been much discussion about whether zero rating should be prohibited in Europe. Beric's interpretation of the law 
echoing what the, the Commission said when the law was adopted, is that zero rating is not prohibited per se. Rather, Berwick has provided guidance on the extent to which zero rating is allowed. There are many types of zero rating, and Berwick's guidelines give examples uh, of some which would clearly infringe the regulation. So, for example, if when an end user reaches their data cap, all applications are blocked except the zero rated application, this would be in breach of the rules. But other types of zero rating are less clear in relation to this regulation, and they will need to be assessed by the regulator on a case-by-case -case basis. And the regulation itself refers to assessments and certain criteria for regulators to take into account in their assessments. And what we do in the Barrett Guidelines is to build on these references, but set out in more detail the various criteria which regulators should use to make these assessments. So I'll just run through some of them now. So firstly, uh, a key test is whether the practices circumvent the general aims of the regulation. A second criteria to take into account is the market positions of the ISPs and of the content and application providers involved. We also guide NRAs to consider any effects on the end user rights of consumer and business users. So, for example, reductions in the range of applications available to them, incentives for end users to use certain applications, or whether there is a material reduction in end user choice. Another criteria is whether there are any effects on the end user rights of content and application providers. So is there an effect on the range of content and applications which CAPS can provide, uh, whether they are materially discouraged from entering the market? Another criteria is the scale of the practice. So for example, the number of end users subscribing to such an offer and the extent to which end users have access to alternative offers or to other ISPs. And then finally, uh, another criteria would be any effects on freedom of expression and on media pluralism. So I'm now going to pass to my co-chair, Frodo Sorensen, to uh, run you through some other details. Thank you, Ben. <coughs> Moving on to traffic management. Traffic management is about the way traffic is forwarded in the networks, ranging from first in, first out as a simple way of transmitting traffic to more sophisticated ways of handling traffic in the network. Barry considers that as long as the traffic management is done independently of applications and end users, the traffic is normally considered to be treated equally, which is a requirement of the regulation as a basic level of traffic management. As a second step, the regulation allows reasonable traffic management, which may be used to differentiate between categories of traffic. And as a third step, the regulation describes three specific exceptions, which are allowed under stricter conditions. And I will go through those two additional steps on the next slide. <coughs> Reasonable traffic management. Categories of traffic could, for example, be defined by reference to application layer protocols or <coughs> generic application types, but only in so far as there is, uh, this is linked to an objectively different technical quality of service requirement, which is the basic condition uh, and Applications with equivalent characteristics are handled in the same category, which is a kind of agnosticism within the category. And finally, the justification given is relevant to the category of traffic in question. Furthermore, NRA should ensure such measures do not monitor specific content. Regarding exceptional traffic management, there are three specific exceptions given by the regulation itself. The first one is about compliance with other laws. 
which is rather elaborate in, in the regulation itself. The second one is preservation of integrity and security of the network, which the guidelines provides several examples of such measures. And finally, congestion management measures, which relates to how traffic is handled in case of uh, congestion or overload in the network. And the guidelines also provide uh, details about the assessment of such practices. <coughs> Moving on to specialized services. The guidelines provide some examples that may be considered as specialized services. The first one is voice over LTE, a kind of high quality voice calling in mobile networks, for example, 4G networks. Second one is linear or live broadcasting of IPTV services with specific quality requirements. And the third example is real-time remote health services, uh, for example, remote surgery, uh, which is, could be considered as, as a typical example. All of these examples and other examples uh, would be subject to meet specific requirements. And those requirements are consisting of two main requirements uh, reflecting the two subparagraphs of the regulation. The first main requirement is the necessity requirement, which asks, are these services necessary to meet requirements for a specific level of quality, or could they alternatively be provided over the Internet Access Service? And the other test, the other requirement, is the capacity requirement, which asks, is the network capacity sufficient that the quality of the Internet Access Service is not degraded? Transparency requirements. The guidelines set out best practices which NRH should look for. Information should be easily accessible, accurate, meaningful, and comparable, which is elaborated in informer, barrack reports as well. This information should cover any traffic management measures used and any impact on the end user the complaint handling procedures, the data caps, and the speeds. And for the speeds, different metrics are provided depending on whether it's a fixed or a mobile access service. The guidelines provide high-level definitions of speeds as well as examples of detailed requirements which NRAs could set to define the various speeds. So there is a certain level of national uh, adaptability in that regard. Finally, the roles of the regulators. Those are divided into three main categories, supervision, enforcement, and reporting. Regarding supervision, <coughs> there are two main parts, the monitoring and the assessment. Regarding monitoring, NRAs could monitor contract information, the commercial practices, the technical traffic management practices, and specialized services. And then these should be assessed to, to, to check the, the practices available in the market. The technical measurements could be used, and information gathering could also be used for, for uh, assessing the market. In case breaches are found, enforcement can be done, and the, the guidelines provide a few examples of what that could be. That could be to require the ISPs to deal with degradation of IAS if such a degradation is found. Require another requirement for ISPs could be to cease or revise problematic traffic management practices if such are found or one could require ISPs to cease providing specialized services in case sufficient capacity is not available for the Internet Access Service. Uh, and or uh, fines could be um, imposed on ISPs. Finally, regarding reporting, NRAs will provide annual reports to Barrack and Commission, as stated in the regulation, and the guidelines set out when to provide these reports 
and what to include in them. Furthermore, Barrack is planning to summarize main findings in these manual reports. And then I hand over to Ben again. Okay, just to sum up from, from Froder and I as the co-chairs, and as Wilhelm said, this consultation gives us the opportunity to road test these guidelines. We're very interested to hear from all stakeholders and from European citizens how these guidelines are viewed. We will take all comments that we receive into account when we finalize the guidelines by the end of August. As is um, standard Beric practice, we also publish a consultation report where we explain to what extent uh, we agree or disagree with the comments received and, and how we took them into account. Of course, we are bound uh, by the law. This is, when, as, as Wilhelm explained, we're not creating new rules. So uh, where stakeholders are uh, calling for the guidelines to take a different approach, we would need to um, see that this is a convincing legal interpretation of, of the law that we are constrained by in producing these guidelines. And in the future, as we said in the guidelines, we will review and update them as and when we consider this to be appropriate. The consultation period itself ends on the 18th of July. Because Berwick itself has a, a 30th of August deadline established in the regulation, a very hard deadline that we have no intention of missing, uh, this means that we don't have the luxury of, of extending the consultation any further than six weeks, and we won't be able to take into account any responses received after the 18th of July. So let me hand back to Wilhelm, who will talk about some of the other outputs. of NGA country stories. Let me also mention that a workshop on this topic was held in Vienna and eight NRAs presented the situation in their countries. Both consultations start today and last until the 1st July 2016. That means for four weeks. The last paper to be published is an input paper on potential regulatory implications of software-defined networking and network functions virtualization. This paper draws on the public workshop held last year. It will also be submitted to the Commission as input to the framework review discussion. And let me use the opportunity of today's debriefing to inform you about the new information sharing portal. This portal is an online documentation tool that enables users to search for various public documents such as reports or decisions published by national regulators. This tool provides an one-stop access to such documents and will be regularly updated by NRAs. Every internet user can access this tool and can use the search functionality. The tool is owned by Barrack and will be maintained by Barrack and the Barrack office. It is open now and already gives access to 200, 235 documents from 30 countries. That's an impressive figure. On the next slide, you see all documents that have been adopted by the 27th Barrack Plenary last Friday. 
And apart from those we already mentioned, let me list in particular the report on termination rates at European level January 2016, as well as the BEREC response to the European Commission's public consultation on the evaluation of the termination rates recommendation. And last but not least, an overview regarding the next meetings. We'll have an extraordinary plenary on the 25th of August here in Brussels to adopt the final guidelines. A press conference will be held here in Brussels on the 30th of August after the final net neutrality guidelines have been submitted to the Commission. So far, thank you very much, and now we are ready for your questions. Please, go ahead. Bonjour, André Fredin pour le Nouvel Obs rue 89. Euh, J'ai une question sur une pratique particulière. Euh, en France, un opérateur, SFR, possède plusieurs titres de presse depuis peu, Libération, L'Express. Et depuis quelques semaines, ce même opérateur, SFR, offre à ses abonnés un accès parfois gratuit à ses titres via une application mobile. Ma première question, c'est est-ce que vous constatez euh, ce même genre de convergence entre les télécoms et les médias ailleurs en Europe Et est-ce que, euh, dans la mesure où certains élus et associations en France considèrent que c'est une atteinte à la neutralité du net, est-ce que vous considérez qu'il faut euh, aller enquêter en profondeur sur, ces, sur cette pratique Merci. Merci beaucoup. C'est une question pour mon ami Sébastien, <rire> parce qu'il n'y a pas une traduction. Um, Sebastian, c'est à vous. Thank you, Willem. Uh, the question deals with uh, the possibility for ISPs to bundle uh, internet access services and free access to some media, in particular online media. And the example that you mentioned deals with uh, Altis. Uh, who is a converging operator between telecom and media in France. Well, um, as, as Willem and the co-chairs of, of the working group mentioned, uh, there is no per se uh, interdiction of uh, zero, ra zero uh, rating or uh, bundling uh, in, in the guidelines, neither in the regulations, so it will be a case-by-case -case, uh, uh, approach. I'm not sure that this kind of practice exists in other EU uh, country. But, well, if there is any kind of complaint in France uh, regarding this specific case you mentioned, we will see if there are other uh, interested NRAs, uh, national regulators in Europe, uh, that would be uh, confronted to the same case and, and propose to have common views on this specific case. But Well, the main point is that this kind of bundling is not uh, forbidden in, in itself and suppose the case-by-case -case analysis. Excuse me. I'm Friedrich Dubak from Telefonica. Good afternoon. Um, I, w I wonder if, if you could um, elaborate a bit on, uh, on the process within BEREC and if this uh, net neutrality guidance were approved uh, on consensus base. I mean, it uh, fully endorsed by all NRAs, or, or was there uh, some description which you can perhaps comment on? Thank you very much. Um, yeah, it's not a secret um, that there has been a broad consensus on that issue. Because, you know, this is a very pragmatic, balanced approach. And there will be this consultation period. And uh, regarding this, we reached a very outbalanced compromise on that issue. 
one in clarification? Uh, if there is a follow-up question, then to, to Mr. Uh, Hank Don, uh, can you perhaps uh, comment how, how this will all fit with the situation in the Netherlands, where apparently there is a law that will ex ante forbid any zero rating, which was not prohibited per se. I just wrote so on the slide. Thank you very much. Thank you for the question. Um, the, the current law which still applies uh, forbids any price discrimination, so also zero rating. There is a new draft law in Parliament, uh, which amounts to the same thing. We'll see what happens. Uh, what we will do as the national regulator, we will uh, uh, enforce Dutch law as it stands. And it's up to the judges to see whether uh, any appeal against that would hold. Please, would you introduce yourself? Thank you. Joe McNamee from European Digital Rights. I'm curious about the meaning of the word specific in relation to do not monitor specific content. Um, you find yourselves in an interesting position as telecom regulators uh, in that you now have become regulators of uh, European fundamental rights as well, such as uh, the freedom, uh, freedom of communication. So um, in your new role as fundamental rights regulators, how do you assess how much uh, specific monitoring of uh, content of communications is too much? Uh, <clears throat> yes, the guidelines gives a rather uh, accurate answer to, to that question. Um, it's, it's a technical answer, so, so uh, forgive me for, for using technical terms, but we consider that uh, monitoring the IP header and the transport layer header is allowed. That, that's a more kind of a generic content, while going beyond the transport layer header, which means you are inspecting the transport layer payload. In that case, you, uh, you would be inspecting uh, the specific content. So that's the user-generated content, which we uh, su suggest, we, we recommend that that should not be in line with the, regulati with the regulation. So just for clarification, we do not regulate content. Thank you. Please, would you introduce yourself? I'm Jennifer Baker, I'm a journalist for Ars Technica. Um, you said that it will be for the judges to decide if it comes to a clash with Dutch law. I mean, do you anticipate this being referred and kicked up to, I mean, the highest courts possible? Francesco Versace from Etno. Uh, a terminology clarification. If I'm not mistaken, the regulation never uses the word net neutrality. Why is it used in the guidelines? Ben? It's uh, a widely used term. Uh, we're trying to connect these guidelines to um, our citizens and explain uh, what this means for all end users. Uh, it's a term stakeholders use, it's a term the media uses, it's a term Beric has used. So we felt comfortable using the term uh, in our guidelines, even if the regulation itself doesn't use that specific term. And please add me some words that I think that is no contradiction to use it, so I don't see the point. Yes. Hello. 
Uh, Thomas Luninger from um, the Safety Internet Campaign and European Digital Rights. Uh, first, I want to thank Barak for the extraordinary good work that they have done if this, with this really hard task to um, find a compromise based on the ambiguities in the regulation. Um, and my question is, um, the guidelines as they stand allow an extensive use of class-based traffic management, even in cases without network congestion. And there are imminent dangers that come with the possibility to do class-based traffic management because it's in the ISP's assessment to um, classify data packages based on the quality of service requirements, protocol, or functionality. Um, how would Barrick assess if there is um, discrimination based on classifying applications or misclassifying applications, particularly in cross-border cases? First of all, um, I will emphasize that the categories of traffic is a term introduced by the regulation, so it's nothing that is invented by Barak as such. We only interpret the law and provide more details about how to understand this uh, from the regulator's point of view. And, and we provide several uh, characteristics that should be in inspected in, in that regard if there is a specific practice in the market. So um, discrimination uh, should not be allowed. So, so <laughs> the regulation here explains it's a question about non-discrimination. So I, I don't see that as a problem. But of course, uh, some practices may be very complex to assess, and, and, and we, we can't give a priori answers uh, to that. But the, 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 regu the, the um, guidelines provide a clarification to the guidelines. That's all it does, nothing more. Um, Sebastian wants to add something. Yes, and, and additionally, what uh, has been said uh, two minutes ago about the limits in terms of uh, monitoring uh, the, the, the IP packets make that, uh, well, virtually some limited uh, possibility of uh, uh, man traffic management by uh, uh, category of traffic is possible virtually, but uh, in the case of encryption of the traffic, uh, this uh, possibility would be not really applicable in practice. So the combined lecture of the two points made that this uh, uh, category-based traffic management quite limited, actually. Thank you. Are there any? Uh, please. Good afternoon, Aurélie Dutrio from Orange. I have a question actually on, on traffic management. Um, in our view, it's clear from the regulation that uh, we cannot uh, discriminate or throttle or whatever, I mean, do certain measures in terms of traffic management for a given uh, end user. But we also think that we, can, we could uh, do uh, different practices between different kind of end user. For instance, to answer specific needs, for instance, uh, emergency activities. And we also think that to allow us to do some differentiation in terms of traffic management uh, would also be uh, maybe more pragmatic in terms of the 5G to come, of the software defined network evolution. And uh, we are wondering whether uh, the guidelines that just were just published will open that possibility to take into account the various needs of the consumer and of the network's evolution. Thank you. Um, I think you have raised the main issues. Um, the point is on differentiation. And this differentiation allows a certain flexibility. Please. Thank you. Estelle Massé from Access Now. 
uh, one of the criteria you've developed for zero rating was on um, the user choice, and I was wondering whether you will be seeking comments from uh, DG Competition or the competition authorities to look into the effect of zero rating in the market. Thank you. Yes, you know that zero rating is a complex and tricky issue because um, according to the regulation, it's neither explicitly allowed nor forbidden. And there have been a lot of negotiations with the Commission, that's clear, but the basis is the regulation. And uh, thus it's pretty clear that technical discrimination where all applications are blocked except the zero rated one when data cap is reached infringes Article 3, Para 3. That is, that is out of question. And several other cases will need further analysis and that is the reason why we stick to this case-by-case -case scenario. Maybe, Ben, um, you can precise that a little bit more. Uh, now, maybe even more broad, but you made a reference to the European Commission. Um, as we talked earlier, we developed the guidelines in close cooperation with the Commission, which was something we were required to do. And so the Commission has been able to already feed in views. I'm sure we would be very happy to uh, welcome any Commission stakeholder views uh, during our consultation but um, we've already benefited from hearing from the Commission as we've drafted it, so I wouldn't expect to hear anything further. Okay, do you have the floor? Um, thank you. Guillermo Beltra from the European Consumer Organization. Just to follow up on the, on the question on zero rating, I'm just skimming through the draft guidelines that have gone online and reading through the paragraphs on zero rating, and I see that the point on um, zero rating of individual applications or uh, which are blocked or slowed down past the data cap is very clear. Then there is a paragraph that, as another example, takes zero rating of entire categories of applications and somehow says that that uh, has possibly less impact on end user choice. My question would be, on this approach on a case-by-case -case basis, what other kind of zero rating practices have you considered that would fall out of the scope of this paragraph and that has therefore should be analyzed uh, carefully by competition authorities and, and NRAs? Thank you. Um, thanks for the question. I think we have, we tried to make it a little bit clear in the presentation, for instance, granny offers that wouldn't be allowed, but maybe ban are you willing to give some more secrets from you? <laughs> or Frode? You asked about examples where we uh, need this case-by-case -case, uh, methodology. Uh, and uh, I think the answer to that is in case you have a zero rating where all applications are blocked when you have used your data cap. So also the zero rated application is blocked in that case then we need a case-by-case -case assessment. Then there is not a clear rule in the guidelines. But you have the floor. Scott Marcus. Good. Thank you, Scott Marcus. I'd simply like to commend Barrick for what appears to me to be, as stated, uh, a balanced and pragmatic approach that's uh, true to the spirit of the legislation. My compliments. Thank you for that. That is always welcome. Are there other questions? Please. Hi, Lita Felton from Vodafone. Um, I noticed in the guidelines that Articles 4, 1, 2, and 3 apply to all contracts. This is the transparency requirements. Regardless of the date, the contract is concluded or renewed. Um, should those requirements not apply as from the 30th of April? And if they did apply to contracts before that date, that would give rise um, to a right to terminate those contracts under the Universal Services Directive. Um, so, Lisa, we... We did, uh, we agree in, in the regulation, we spell out that the regulation applies from 30th of April for those 
um, contracts. That's paragraph 185. So, um, oh, okay. So that's maybe something we need to be, um, a clarification we need to make in the finalization. Thanks for spotting that. Yes, we, we do clarify it's from the 30th of April in paragraph 185, but thanks for spotting that. Yeah. And we hope other stakeholders will let us know if there are any other things we've missed in the consultation. That is why the consultation process is for. So, um, ladies first, would you agree? Thank you, uh, Telia Company, Agle Harvey. You have mentioned that in the context of a zero rating, some uh, criteria will be assessed, and one criteria is uh, impact on freedom of expression and media. And the question is, will the national NRAs be uh, well equipped to address those issues? <laughs> Why me? <laughs> <laughs> Well, um, the regulation mentions that uh, Internet access services must comply with all union laws, including the general principles of, of, of human rights. Uh, so this is a criteria we have to take into account, but I have to insist on the fact that it is a criteria, a criteria beyond others. So we have to... Con to to, to go to a complete analysis of a given practice and to look at the different uh, uh, criterion of uh, access to a user, uh, a market share of the, the ISP and, and, and from the contact and access provider and so forth and so forth. And within this criterion, the questions uh, from uh, freedom of speech can, can be raised, but uh, you don't have to consider <laughs> us um, as a, a, a kind of watchdog of uh, freedom of speech, this is clearly not the task of uh, national uh, regulatory authorities. Thank you. Ralf Nigge from Deutsche Telekom. I also commend Barrick for finding a compromise on in this very difficult exercise. However, we feel we had little time to analyze the guidelines, obviously. We feel that there are a number of areas where we see concerns over future innovation in networks and services. And this concerns, for example, a general preference for adding capacity uh, without looking at whether other mechanisms may be more efficient. Um, secondly, we would ask Bereg, irrespective of the concrete content of the draft now, to stay strictly within the remits of the regulation, which you obviously um, endeavored. Uh, this concerns, for example, the question of services other than specialized services that are not covered by the regulation. And so further specifications on these services would be a worry, obviously, because they always can curtail innovation in a future 5G or, or other technology context. Thank you. Yes, you are welcome to take part in the consultation process. We will, thanks. Thank you. Maybe just a follow-up question on this one. So Aurélie Lutrio from Orange again. Um, on specialized services or other services than EIS, uh, as my colleague, I mean, I haven't had the chance to go through the guidelines that were just published at 2 o'clock, but um, is it right to consider that there is no positive definition of both services uh, in, in the guidelines? I'm not sure if I catch the question correctly, but you asked whether there was a positive um, assessment, uh, positive characteristics of voice services? No, whether, I mean, in the regulation during the legislative debate, there was a lot of debate on how, whether should we define precisely what are the specialized services. And at the end, the co-legislator decided that the scope of the regulation was on EIS, so they defined EIS, but as such, they have not given a list of criteria for 
apart necessity and uh, optimize services for specialized services. And I was wondering whether the guidelines um, stay into th in that lane or whether they go further in trying to specify those services. We, we, we describe that quality of service requirements uh, are important when it comes to assessment of the necessity of providing the service as a specialized service instead of the internet access service. And that's the reason why we also suggest voice over LTE as an example that could be considered as a specialized service. So I think we answer that question to some extent in, in the guidelines. Yeah, and just to add to that, we uh, we don't go really further than the law itself. But the law talks about them and and talks about uh, necessity requirements and capacity requirements in Article 3.5. And so we we go into what that might mean and how you would understand that as a regulator when you're implementing the law. We don't go beyond. Mm -hmm. All we do is provide a few examples of what a, a specialized service might be mm -hmm. to aid the understanding of the regulator. But I think we are still remaining within. Article three five. Thank you. On paragraph one hundred eighteen, and connecting to um, what previous speaker just said, I'm asking if this decision of Barrick to allow a specialized service to reduce the bandwidth of internet access service up to the point where only the minimum quality is upheld is actually considered to be in line with the regulation, particularly as the legislative history points towards a deletion of the word other on July 6, in the last sentence of the first paragraph of Article 3.5, where the general quality of the Internet access service for the other end user became the quality for the end user. And similarly, um, the transparency requirement of Article 4.1d uh, which also stated there has to be a transparency about the minimum average and maximum transparent um, bandwidth of Internet access services. How can that be uphold when the average and the maximum speed are no longer met, not even accordingly to the definition given um, by Barrick in the guidelines? I think, um, to all my respect, I think that should be discussed during the consultation process. That is why we start this consultation process for six weeks to get your input and we are ready even to imp if there are aspects to improve, we will do so. So I'm Walter van der Weide from Ericsson. One, uh, one remark and one, one question for, for you. Um, f fully supporting, Ericsson fully supports the, the worries expressed by, uh, by Orange and by Deutsche Telekom, especially on, on capacity, the focus on capacity and the, uh, <coughs> the new technology mandates we see in the text, so we, don't, we didn't see before in the, in the regulation. Uh, and then the question would be on, 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 on regulatory fragmentation, what would the, uh, the, the guidelines do to avoid uh, regulatory fragmentation, something that of course would be bad and would create uh, legal uncertainty uh, going forward, uh, looking at all the new innovations, we, we're going to see and we don't yet know uh, what, what they will be. So what, is it, what are the guidelines doing to that respect? Okay. To your first question, the reference to capacity, we've taken that from the second subparagraph of Article 3.5 and that's how we've understood it within the guidelines. Uh, we are very interested to hear from uh, from ISPs, from equipment providers, how um, the regulation and, and this interpretation of, of how it should be implemented would impact innovative services. We also say within the guidelines that specialized services will evolve over time, and that's why uh, a case-by-case -case basis assessment by NRAs is something that the guidelines recommend. With your second question about regulatory fragmentation, we feel like we've gone into quite a lot of de detail looking at uh, the whole regulation, providing a lot of guidance for NRAs on how to implement it. The Barrett guidelines need to be taken into utmost ac account by regulators, 
So this is why we believe that it's going to contribute to consistent application across Europe. Stephen um, Dwala, uh, Huawei. Um, do I understand correctly that the guidelines also offer guidance with respect to what is to be considered as a normal functioning of, uh, of Internet or sufficient capacity available for, for Internet? And do they provide guidance on how this should be monitored, measured uh, across the European continent? Is there a methodology provided for that or is the consultation going to uh, uh, ask for input on that? Thank you. Uh, we suggest that um, regulators could do measurements to um, verify this. Uh, for example, uh, you could do measurements before a specialized service introduced and similar type of measurements afterwards and then compare the results. In case the results afterwards are lower than before, that's not a good signal, of course. So it, it could be a practical approach uh, by using measurements uh, Barak has provided uh, guidance regarding measurements in, in earlier publications as well, and there is also another work stream upcoming that will provide further details about how to measure quality of the Internet Access Service. So this is also ongoing work, but we provide some guidance in, in, in the guidelines uh, already today. If you allow, we would come back to some Twitter questions. Anagrid will read them out. First one is from The Guardian, from Kate, uh, sorry, Kate Saunders. And the question is, what analysis has been done on the effect of the net neutrality rules on different models of ad blockers? And I would hand over to Ben. So in response to that question, I. I'd say that Beric has not analyzed these business models. Uh, what we did was look at the law and provide guidance on how to implement the law. Uh, we will, of course, be interested to hear from ISPs, CAPS, uh, such as The Guardian is a, is a publisher, a content provider, how the regulation and its implementation would impact their business models. But it's not in Beric's power to amend the law there will be limits to what we can do with that information. Okay, so then there are a number of questions from uh, John Strand, uh, Denmark Consultancy. Uh, the first one is about uh, the transparency of the process and uh, the question of uh, who selected the experts on the workshop. It seemed that uh, he is uh, saying that these experts are all um, along the same lines. So probably... I hand over to Henk to answer this question. Thank you, Annegret. Um, yes, we had, uh, the speakers on the workshop we had in Rotterdam in the, in the first plenary of this year uh, were selected uh, by the co-chairs of the working group, the Berek chair, and myself as responsible vice chair. And we were looking for uh, sufficient differences of views, and I think we have heard some different views in that session. Uh, and it was very inspiring for us to, uh, as input to the work. Thank you. One more question from John Strand about uh, zero rating. Uh, he says that Beric had called this bonded connectivity and asks the question on why there was a sudden change of the position. Can I ask uh, Ben to reply to this? Yes. So Beric hasn't um, published a a position on whether or not zero rating should be allowed before. Uh, in a 2015 consumer research report on how consumers value net neutrality, uh, Beric did a, there was a one-page case study on zero rating, and uh, Beric said that based on what is observed in the market, it's too early to give a full assessment of zero rating in terms of competition, consumer welfare, and innovation. And Shortly after that uh, report was published, the regulation was adopted, and therefore we've developed a, a position in these guidelines of how you should implement 
the uh, the regulation in in reference to zero rating. Thank you. And one more from John Strand. Uh, so there's a question of how does Beric define stakeholders and who gets on the list? Uh, is it just a question of who is being able to, s to yell louder? I would like to ask Wilhelm to answer this question. <laughs> yes, um, thank you very much to have the privilege to answer this question. Um, the question is about the definition of stakeholders, I think. And we tried in the process to have negotiation on workshops on the national level. We have so the question of stakeholders is not about who screams louder, but who has the better arguments. And let me be clear on that. The net neutrality guidelines are the result of the work of all NRA's rep experts and represent the collective knowledge of all our experts. And I want to underline that we want to engage with all stakeholders in a constructive dialogue on the substance of the text. And I hope I have expressed that um, very clearly now. Thank you. Thank you. One more uh, in that direction. It's about why Beric has not made an assessment of different approaches to net neutrality across the EU. Uh, you should be able to see which sets of rules create the most innovation. That is what an expert independent regulator would do. Maybe you can also take this one. Yes. The regulation gave us the task to produce guidelines and to show up that Barak has the ability and the willingness to create such guidelines. And I think um, that was our task, and Barak has shown up. Thank you. So now I would like uh, to ask again Hank to reply, because it is about the Netherlands. The question is, why is it that the Netherlands and India have to lead the way when it comes to zero rating? and why there can't be a predictable single market regulation that attracts investment into European startups and fair competition. Thank you. Um, our legislators in the Netherlands have taken a clear position on the admissibility of zero rating in the past, and now they discuss in Parliament a draft law which uh, has the same effect. Our minister claims he that this is compliant with regulation, and as I said, uh, we will enforce Dutch law and uh, whenever uh, we find infringements and then see what uh, the next step will be. Um, why is it that we have to lead the way? Well, it's not our choice. It's a clear, firm position of our parliament and our cabinet uh, that they want it to go this way. Um, I can't talk for India. <laughs> um, but uh, this is the position that we are in, uh, and why Parliament took this firm stance, that's a bit of history uh, that uh, people may want to go into. Uh, the actual incident that uh, got us into Parliament was that our incumbent uh, announced that they would do deep packet inspection, uh, and that created a riot in Parliament. Sebastian wants to add something. Yes, thank you very much. Well, it's not on this subject. Uh, I just wanted to come back to the question about why did Berek changed his mind uh, considering zero rating or uh, uh, also the question considering our possible cooperation with competition authorities uh, concerning zero rating. I just wanted to make very clear that we have on this question of zero rating a specific rule uh, coming from a specific principle, which is net neutrality. And then we, we are trying now to apply this. So it's not only a question of competition, it's not only a question of freedom of speech, as mentioned uh, uh, previously. So it's 
the, the, the regulation is a principle in itself. The, the, we, we received NRA's, BEREC, a kind of political mandate from the 28 uh, member states, from the parliament, from the commission, to apply specific rules regarding net neutrality. So at one moment, uh, we, we can have assumed some general considerations about zero rating and competition, but now we have a specific rule to apply. So it's, it's not exactly the same story. I just wanted to, to make that clear. Thank you. I think that was very important to add. Uh, now I have a question from Anonymous, uh, and it is a very technical question, so it goes to Frode about uh, t um, uh, traffic management. So the question is, instead of investing in their network on neutral applications, sorry, uh, on neutral, uh, neutral appli uh, applications, agnostic traffic management, ISPs are allowed to prioritize different applications into different quality classes at all times, <laughs> even in the absence of congestion. Why are you allowing this distortion of competition? Why is it not pro prohibited to um, e.g. discriminate against encrypted or anonymized traffic or voice chat? In that case, probably the question wouldn't have arrived here. Why create uncertainty and lack of transparency? First of all, I would like to repeat what I said previously, that this is not invented by Barak. This is um, a concept. The categories of traffic is a concept uh, which is provided by the regulation itself. So we try to clarify how it should be understood. Um, that said, uh, we should be clear that this is a, a question about categories of traffic and not a question about prioritization of specific applications as such. So as, as we uh, clarified in the, in the guidelines, if there are several different applications that have similar quality of service requirements, they should be handled agnostically in the same category. And the same also goes for encrypted traffic. The way we have uh, defined um, uh, monitoring of specific content, uh, in many cases it will be possible to see what kind of traffic that is sent in the network even though it's uh, encrypted. For example, uh, the application can signal uh, that it's a voice application based on on the uh, port number and other parameters in, in, in the headers. So it's not necessarily that uh, an encrypted traffic is discriminated. Uh, it's not always possible, of course, to detect uh, whether it's a voice traffic, for example, if it's encrypted. Um, and, and then we also say, uh, clarify in the guidelines that uh, traffic should not be discriminated because it is encrypted. So that's also a, a safeguard that is provided in, in uh, the guidelines. And there is also um, clearly stated in the guidelines that if providers are using this mechanism, it should be done transparently. So. Uh, application providers and, and regulators, etc., should be fully aware of these mechanisms in the network, so it's possible to adapt to uh, the traffic management in the network as such. Thank you. And we have, I think, a final one uh, for Wilhelm. So it's about from Rosaline Leighton, and it, uh, the question is, how wise is it for Barrick to adopt hard net neutrality rules when it looks like rules will be struck down in the US? <laughs> <laughs> yes, as pointed out at the beginning of my statement, I think the main difference between the FCC order and what we have done now by Barrick is the following. Um, the Barrack mini board has been to the US um, some days before, and we met Tom Wheeler, the FCC chairman. And every Tuesday, every Friday, he's waiting for the court and thinking what will the court done with his FCC rule on net totality, because the court can change that. Even a new administration after the election, with a new FCC chairman and a new FCC commissioner board, could change the FCC order on net neutrality. In Europe, that is another issue. We have a regulation that is a more, more robust, a more legal-based approach. 
So from our point of view, Europe is far ahead regarding legal certainty on that issue. And that is, I think, the beef on that question. Yes, thank you. We have a third set of questions. I take only those which have not yet been answered. Uh, so uh, there's one uh, related to, uh, I can't read the email address, Nordics, UK and uh, others have best record on net neutrality with soft rules. EU abandon abandons this approach uh, that works best for startups. Why? Can I ask Ben as UK? <laughs> and there's a bit of a theme here, but it, it's unfortunately, um, we well, not unfortunately, but we are given a law to uh, implement. So it's not that Beric is abandoning uh, an approach. Um, Beric and national regulators are implementing a law that's been adopted by our MEPs and our governments. Yes, thank you for clarifying this. We have one more. Um, how can you avoid fragmentation when many issues are going to be decided nationally on a case-by-case -case basis? Um, can I have a go? Yeah, please. I, I'm going to try. Yeah, yeah okay. <laughs> uh, because this is, a, this is a very sensitive question. At the end of the day, I think we will get a coordinated okay. process okay. between the regulators. What we can't change are the conditions laid down in the regulation. So the guidelines have to strictly stick to the provisions of the regulation. And the regulation is a political compromise. And we can't change the circumstances of this process. But I think what we will see at the end of the day, a kind of coordinated process inside BAREC and within the national regulators. Maybe Hank, Sebastian, because this is we representing the mini board actually of BAREC, can give their philosophy on that. I, I think you put it quite rightly, Wilhelm. Uh, will, we'll, we will be in close contact implementing these guidelines after they've been adopted uh, end of August. And we'll monitor what cases we get, all NRAs in Europe, and also update the guidelines when we see the need to do so. So it's a learning process in a way, not just the con through the consultation, but also after that. And we are committed to try and find a harmonized way of implementing this throughout Europe. But it, that's not the same as saying we know how to do it exactly. We have to find our way, and I think this is a very good start, and I'm curious to see what the consultation will bring. No, I fully agree. Uh, I, I, I just want to, to mention uh, at, a, uh, at a very technical level that uh, the regulation uh, has uh <coughs> there is a provision that makes uh, an obligation to any national regulatory authority to issue an annual report uh, on its implementation of the regulation within its member states, uh, and this report must be uh, uh, issued and, and transmitted to both the Commission and the BEREC, so there will be a kind of uh, a process that will <coughs> make us possible to check that we have a common implementation of, of, of the regulation. Thank you. One more technical question, and then we come Please. back to the... I don't know if, if you heard the question because the mic wasn't on, but it was a question about why uh, the provider uh, is giving the quality requirements for, for the specialized service, short version of, of the question. Uh, and the answer is that I think that's a misunderstanding. Um, the assessment of specialized services is rather complex, so it, it's a long text. Uh, so it says in the beginning that Initially, the requirements of an application is set by the provider of the specialized service, 
And of course, when he provides the service, he, he will have some requirements he wants to, to uh, fulfill in, in, in his service. And then the guidelines goes on in, in the next paragraph saying, when assessing whether the practice used to provide specialized services comply with the article, the following approach should be used. And the following approach is first to collect information from the provider. And then it says in paragraph 106, 107, NRAs should verify whether and to what extent optimized delivery is objectively necessary to ensure one or more specific or key features of the application. So the guidelines uh, says that uh, NRAs should verify that uh, this uh, quality requirement is objectively necessary. So I think that's clear. Please. Florian Damas from Nokia. Some terms like admission control and virtually separated were dropped from the final legal text, probably for good reasons. Could you please explain us why they are back? Is the text not over prescriptive on how technology works or should work? Thank you. So uh, you ask why there are certain technical terms that we've included in the guidelines which were not included in the regulation. Uh, one of the roles of these guidelines is to help NRAs understand what was meant by the law and how to interpret it and implement it. And so there are, there are phrases where we've provided uh, extra information and built upon the regulation to, to help NRAs understand that. We don't feel we've done it to be more prescriptive than the law, rather, rather we've done it to help NRAs understand how to implement the law. Uh, it's, it's a question and uh, it's a re uh, no, it's a remark and then a question that I will answer myself. So that's good news. So Friedrich Bach for Telefonica. Yeah, it's just a remark uh, from myself, from Telefonica, and I fear from a lot of my colleagues and other uh, telecom companies that we are actually uh, firmly disappointed uh, as we think that this uh, graph drive lines are a lot more restrictive than that we felt when the regulation was approved. Uh, I can, we will detail that in our response, of course. Uh, and then the question I have, which I will respond, is uh, do you think that with those guidelines existed like 15 years ago, we would have seen IPTV, a specialized services that everybody um, acknowledges that is not uh, really particularly problematic? Uh, well, uh, my answer is I don't think so. I don't think so, and why? And it's not because I think regulators would now look at uh, IPTV as something they should forbid. It is just that in the investment company, within the companies, on the innovation board, they would just not have given the money to start developing IPTV. If they have to look at UI, we will have to prove that this is necessary, that quality, or we will have to prove uh, in some way that there is no capacity problem. Probably in the innovation stage, when you have to put the money to innovate in that service, well, you cannot answer those questions. So, so this will probably be a big hamper on innovation. And the problematic thing is we won't see this. So we won't see things that won't happen, of course. OK, that was a remark, not a question. Um, it's always difficult to answer two remarks, because um, then you are a little bit lost, because it has to do with questions of philosophy and how you see um, economics and dynamics of markets and so on. So um, if you agree, I will not uh, further on comment on that. Um, I think it's better to thank you for attending the press conference. Um, I'm appreciated that we will have a lot of input. So I'm looking forward to your comments during the consultation process. And I want to thank you in the name of my colleagues and uh, hope we will have so much attendance for the next <laughs> outcome of our plenary at the end of August here in Brussels. Thank you very much.